Hello everyone, welcome back to the course on quantum theory of many body systems in condensed matter here at the Institute of Physics at the University of Sao Paulo. My name is Luis Gregorio Diaz and in today's class we're going to continue to cover the topic of time evolution in quantum mechanics and in this class, hopefully it's going to be a shorter class, we're going to talk about equations of motions for or equations of motion for operators uh, and time order correlation functions. More specifically, we're going to go over the equation of motion for creation and destruction operators in a non-interacting Hamiltonian. We're going to see how that can be solved exactly. And then we're going to re uh, cover retarded and advanced correlation functions, these time ordered correlation functions that I mentioned before, and how to do the Fourier transform of them. These are all topics that are going to be important when we start to study Green's functions, time order Green's functions, for instance. All right, so let's go right in. Okay, let's start with a quick review for the equation of motion for operators. In particular, we're going to try to derive the equations of motion for creation and destruction operators. So as we saw in the previous class, I'll try to remember to put a link here if you haven't seen it please watch the previous class where we discussed the Heisenberg picture and the equation of motion for, for operators in, in the Heisenberg picture. So, uh, say the operator AK, say a destruction operator for a particle at state K, if I write it in the Heisenberg picture, the equation of motion is essentially given by this, the derivative of the operator AK at time t equals I over H bar. The commutator, this is a, so I'm including a minus here, the commutator of the Hamiltonian with the operator written in the Heisenberg picture. So I'm, every time that I have an operator here with, uh, at a time t, um, saying that this is an operator in, in the Heisenberg picture. And remember, this is the commutator, independently of whether this is a fermionic or bosonic operator, okay? And in the Heisenberg picture, you, you define the operator at time t as this. This is the, Heis the operator in the Schrodinger picture, so this is the time independent, or if you want, this is the, is the operator in the Heisenberg picture at t equals zero, and then you multiply it, you multiply uh, this operator on the on the right by e to the minus i h t over h bar, and on the left by e to the plus i h t over h bar. And one thing that we discussed in uh, last class, and again, I'll try to remember to, to put the link there, is that at different times, these operators might not commute or anti-commute as they do at the same time, okay? So at a given time, for a time at t equals zero, for instance, we know that the, the, the operators in the Schrodinger picture, they will uh, commute or anti-commute depending on the, on the statistics. At different times, this is not as clear. So, in order to calculate the a commutator or a ninth commutator at different times, we need we really need, need to know how do these operators evolve in time. So, let's try and calculate this for a very particular case where you, we have a diagonal Hamiltonian such as this one. And we want to calculate how is a k of t. It turns out that a k of t in this case is the operator in the Schrodinger uh, case or in the Heisenberg uh, picture at time t equals zero times a phase. All right. So this commutator and or anti-commutator here will simply be. Uh, a delta function, right? Delta km. 
depending on whether this, these particles are bosonic or fermionic. Uh, if they are bosonic, this would be the minus sign, so you, you have the commutator. If they are fermionic, it would be the plus sign. And here would be the, just a the delta that you, we are used to. But this will involve this extra phase factor here that, that will depend on time. Okay, so how do we get to this result? How do we solve this equation and, and, and get this? So let's go to the blackboard and, and see how it's done. So in the previous class, we mentioned how we can calculate this commutator between the Hamiltonian at uh, which is time independent, always in, independently of the picture, and the operator in the Heisenberg picture, right, AK, and this would be equal to the whole thing. I can always write, but I, I prefer to, to do it like this, to the commutator between the Hamiltonian in the and the operator in the Heisenberg picture in the Schrodinger picture then everything at the Heisenberg picture it doesn't really matter but we, it is important that uh, we can do this so this is essentially e to the i h t and then the commutator a a k oops that's right like this okay all right so let's calculate this guy first so if I have h equals, okay, let's choose another letter here instead of k. Let's take j, for instance. ej, aj, dagger, aj. Now let's calculate this. Okay. Uh, well, I want to calculate precisely this guy H acting on AK so there will be an AK here all right and then I also want to calculate AK acting on H this would be AK sum of j, epsilon j, aj, aj. Okay, so let's continue writing this guy. Let's see what we get. So ak h equals sum over j, epsilon j, ak aj dagger aj now this guy we know that if it is, if these are bosons then i have ak aj equals delta kj if they're fermions, it would be like this. Oops. AK AJ equals delta KJ. In the first case, right here, so if they're bosons, I would have the commutator. So AK AJ minus AJ AK equals delta. So 
would be something like that delta kj plus a j k and for fermions would be something like that a k j equals delta k j minus a j k okay so in either case we have a k h equals there will be al always a delta k j there so it would be in both cases a term that would be um, something like this a k a j sorry a k a j plus or minus right plus a term like which is like this sum of j epsilon j and this this term is this one and the other one with the delta kj is this one it's going to be delta kj aj right okay now uh, this of course this is the sum over j so when I sum I, I will get a k times the energy at state k the same k here plus or minus or or if you want would be something like this even well plus or minus I mean if I if I exchange these two then I would get uh, uh, the plus or minus that I, I had before so I'll just multiply it by we'll get just a plus and I'll have the J a J a J times a K here I'll get another plus or minus times this which is of course just epsilon K a K plus the Hamiltonian times a K all right, so this a k h meaning that if I now subtract this this from this so I have a k h minus h a k uh, I would get epsilon k a k or if I have um, this means that the commutator of h and a k equals minus Okay. All right. Great. So I calculate this. So I, I can go back now to my equation and say that then the equation of motion for a k t d e h is this is still in Schrodinger picture. So what I would have to do is this is I over A calculate the, the E H T over H bar. This this is I, I just calculated. Right? This would be E. This is minus E K A K E minus E H T H bar 
which is just minus i epsilon k h bar times a k at t. All right, so that's the equation of motion that I want to solve. Meaning that, and the solution is precisely that AK T should be, well, the exponential of that, right? P minus EK T over H bar times a k at zero which is precisely what I had before uh, and remember notice this minus sign here which comes from from, from the minus sign so this is the, the solution for the equation of motion for this operator on this particular case for the for this Hamiltonian here okay so for this Hamiltonian here, that's, that's the, the solution. It's a closed form solution for the equation of motion. Now, if I want to calculate the, in the following commutator, then A, say, at a given time, T1 and a k that's, that's not but k k prime say a k prime dagger at t equal prime t1 and either for bosonic or or fermionic particles what would be the 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 result well if a k depends on time as this I just take the complex conjugate of this and I should get that AK dagger equals exponential plus I epsilon K, the single particle energy of four state K, T over H bar, AK dagger at zero. So if I take, say, AK T1 times AK prime dagger at t2 this is going to be what this is going to be e i epsilon e minus e k t um, kind of tiring of writing this h bar gonna drop it soon this is a k at zero e plus i epsilon k prime at t h bar uh, a k um, dagger k prime zero and um, and the other way around would be a k prime t two a k t1 equals e minus e equals plus e k prime this is t1 and this is t2 here this one t2 h bar a k dagger prime 0 e minus e k t1 h bar a k zero one more line so the commutator would be this minus this so the commutator of no the commutator or anti-commutator the commutator would be for this is for fermions this is for bosons so let's see these so let, let's call it for fermions first I would do 
yeah, let's let's do it for fermions. Be something like this. A K T one. A K prime. Dagger. T two. Here I have. So it would be this plus this. I'll have E. Um, minus E K T one plus I E K prime T two over H bar. A K zero A K dagger zero plus the same thing, right? A minus E I E K T one plus E K prime T two. So this would be just a commutator. A K the anti the anti commutator, sorry. A K, which is just delta K K prime. All right. So if K equals K prime, and let's let's do it now. So there's a phase times. So it would be some some phase times delta K K prime. So if and let's just take the case of K K prime equals k prime then a k t1 a k t2 which at equal times will be just one right here would be something like e um Let's write like this minus. So this is plus. So yeah, if if I write the minus, well, depends on whether I put the minus outside of the parentheses or inside. Let's put the minus out of the out of here. So I have. Oops, sorry change colors epsilon k then it's going to be t1 minus t2 over h prime times 1 okay otherwise it's going to be uh well that yeah let's just just do here this should be a minus let's put the minus i outside like this like this and a minus i minus t2 yeah so here we got a plus e k prime t two and that's it. All right. Okay. So that's what you get. This this is, would be one times one. Okay. So that's uh, what we get for the anti commutator of for fermions. For bosons would be the same, right? Here I would, I would, I would calculate the commutator. So this would be. A minus and for bosons I would get so in general yeah let's write the, the full expression in both cases let's do it like this so it k equals k prime either fermions or bosons so bosons and fermions would be something like that all right
for k equal k prime. If they're not equal, then I'll, I'll get this phase, right? Then a delta k, k prime there. All right, let's go back to this. So here, uh, I changed a little bit the, the slide uh, to accommodate the calculation that we just made for the case where these indices are different. K, and in the blackboard I called K prime, let's call it M. But this is the phase that you get, right? So if K equals to M, then you get this to exponential of minus I epsilon K T1 minus T2, where you know these these two this is the difference of times between them so these these are the cases where you have the commutator that or the anti-commutator depending on whether you have bosons or fermions at different times and in this case for this hamiltonian you can do it exactly all right and this in general for quadratic hamiltonians you can do it exactly in general so this is going to be an assignment assignment in the previous class we discussed about uh, the tight mighty model uh, as an, in in the assignment as well I you, you can go there and, and and look how you can diagonalize a Hamiltonian like this for instance we did it for fermions but you can also do it for bosons but is Hamiltonian which is still quadratic right so it is in a sense uh, diagonalizable in for the n particle state you can f you can find it in terms say in, you can write in this in the basis for the eigenstates of this part and so here you have these operators that you have you know off diagonal terms a k, a k one dagger a k two and and the converse so the, the whole thing is still hermitian and even in this case, and this is going to be an assignment for this class, you can write the equations for for both of these, uh, AK and AK um, dagger, and you're going to see that uh, you you get a system of uh, of closed a closed systems so systems of linear equations for for the for the operators, and in principle, you can you can simply uh, integrate it. Uh, this this system of uh, of equations, and in fact, uh, you, this is going to be one of the assignments where this is solvable in in the sense, in the very very much sense that you could in principle diagonalize this this Hamiltonian and then write, you know the 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 these operators, these linear combinations of operators, and see where you close close the equation of motion. However, if you have an interacting term such as this, a quartic term, and here I've wrote in in a, in a way that you you still get some some uh, the sum is only only over three uh, indices, not four. Uh, here is you can think of it as some sort of uh, conservation of a quantum number, right? You could think of this in terms of moment, momentum, and later we'll, this will be a momentum as well. But in this case, you can, if you write the the equations of motion for 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 that, is going to be very different than than what you get here. And here, in principle, you cannot do it. You you they don't close in the, in the sense and when you do the assignment you notice what i mean by closing uh, here uh, you get higher order terms that uh, will not fall into this linear category okay the, i mean it's not it's not just going to be a linear a system of linear equations you get other types of uh, contributions as well so one way to truncate and rewrite this the hamiltonian in this form or something like that would be to do mean field theory uh, and we covered that in a previous class so I'll try to remember to put the link here and uh, but that would essentially transform this term into a one-body term so 
In general, in the interacting case, you cannot close the equations of motion and the same way as you do for the single particle case. Okay, now we're in a position to talk about correlation functions and particularly time-dependent correlation functions. So we discussed how you, you can calculate commutators between of operators between in different times, right? And we noticed that uh, you you might want to to solve the the equation of motion for for the operators in order to calculate that. And now we're going to calculate the correlation between pairs of operators at different times. Now all this we're going one step further, writing the operators in the Heisenberg representation and then calculating the expected value, like the term of expected value for a given um, density, for the density operator, well, either the canonical or the, the grand canonical one, but this would be the definition, right? So here, the the density operator is written in the Schrodinger basis. So the only time dependence is in the operators where A and B, okay? And it turns out that this trace or this correlation function only depends on the difference between T prime and T, right? Not on the specific, uh, it will depend on time on, only on this difference, and this is easy to show. It, essentially, this you can expand this in this form, where the only dependence is in, on t minus t prime. Okay, so yeah, let's go to the blackboard and, and do it real quick. All right, so you remember who is the density operator? So density operator and we if this is essentially e minus beta h and we find that in one of the earlier classes i'll try to add the link here if i remember so uh and now we want to calculate this guy right the tray so we want to calculate a at time t b at time t prime which is 1 over z, the trace of rho a of t, b of t prime. Okay, I'll stop here because I think your screen is ending somewhere around there. All right, again, in the Heisenberg, this is all Heisenberg, okay? In the Heisenberg, picture this is what you get this is e i i'm i'm gonna drop the h bar for now okay then we, we can reinstate it but i'll drop i'll take h bar equals one definitely tired of writing the h bar all, all the time so that's what you get right a this is an extraordinary picture minus i h and b at t prime equals e oops i h t prime b e minus i h t prime all right so let's calculate that trace so bro so let's do it like this bro a T don't even need to calculate the trace. This is just going to be E. Well, let's write down here. I'm gonna be running out of space. This is E minus beta H E I H T A E minus I H T 
then I was right B EIHT prime so this is mine okay sorry yeah let's already do it like this T prime B so this guy is in here already right EI plus H T prime and then I keep doing this is E minus I H T prime all right yeah we're, we're gonna need the trace anyway so um, let's do it Let, let's do the trace then row A B T prime so when I'm calculating the trace, remember that property of the trace that, uh, uh, so let, yeah, let's just write this. E minus B H E I H T A E minus I H T minus T prime B E minus I H T prime. All right. Now remember that property of the traces. A trace if you have three matrix A, B, C, D. If you do a uh, just a shuffling of of these, but keeping the the order the same. Say so say but D, A, B, C. Here, this should not alter the trace. Same thing as 3, C, D, A, B. All right, so this is a property of the trace. If you do a, a shift on, on these operators inside the trace, so notice that I'm not saying that A, B, C, D equals C, D, A, B. No, I'm just saying that the trace of these two products is the same. So it's a property of the trace. So as, 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 as long as I have this shift, but I, I do not commute to two of them, right? I don't, I do, don't do any, any permutation. Uh, well, you, you can do the cyc cyclic permutations but you cannot you know change the two of them and keep the others the same so as long as you you have the cyclic yeah cyclic property of the trace then you're fine meaning that this guy I can write as trace I can I can put this guy right over here and the trace would be the same okay this would be trace of e minus i h t prime e minus beta h e i h t uh, a e minus h t minus t prime b all right so this is a parenthesis just to show that the, the cyclic property of the trace. So let's again. And now, now I can commute things here. So this guy, they commute. Why? Because I have H on both of them. So this would be trace of E minus B beta H. Then I'll, I'll bring this guy close to this one. So I have e to the plus i h t minus t prime a e minus i h t minus t prime, right? Meaning that my correlation function, which is this a t b t prime, only depends. On the difference between 
t and t prime all right so yeah let's let's go back now to the to the slide so this yeah comes it only works because we're talking about a trace yeah and then there's the the one over z here sorry oops so yeah one over z one over the partition function so let's go back to the slide okay good so we just show that this expected value here of the product of a at time t and b at time t prime will give will only depend on the difference the, the the difference between t and t prime notice however that this difference can be either positive if t is larger than t prime or it can be negative if t prime is larger than t then uh, we want to uh, uh, define the time dependent correlation functions for the two cases when I'm calculating the correlation between uh, in this order here a times b when the time associated with b is smaller than the time associated with a so uh, the time evolution at b goes up, up to a time that is earlier or retarded relative to the time where I do the time evolution for operator A. In this case, I'm this would be a retarded correlation function. Again, this correlation function only depends on the difference between t minus t prime, but I'll make sure that this is t, uh, that t is always larger than t prime. So I have this theta function here, this half side function multiplicating this um, uh, this expected value so this is the retarded correlation function between a and b and this function only depends on the difference between t minus t prime and this thing will be positive okay now i have to you know for completeness i, I need to to also uh, be able to define the correlation function for t minus t prime having negative values and that's the advanced uh, the so-called advanced uh, correlation function when t prime is larger than t so i evolve b up to a time that is larger than the time that which i evolved a so b is you know probing things that happened uh, so a is probing things that happen before b before you know the time where, where b uh, is probing so that's what we call the advanced correlation function so here's another theta i'll call your attention to the difference in in sign here by minus i and plus i then we'll see why that is in a bit but this is then uh, only defined when t minus t prime is negative or t prime minus t is positive so other otherwise this is zero so this gives me these two definitions for time dependent correlation functions and let's see now what i can do with it and one thing we can do is take a fourier transform of this time dependent correlation functions so let's start with the retarded one and i will define my correlate my Fourier transform and that would be then the correlation function at a given uh, frequency omega like this so is the integral and the time domain and in this variable t minus t prime so you can call it t and set t prime to zero uh, that's one way it's very usual usual to do that so would be then e to the i omega t minus t prime times the correlation function the retarded say and remember here t minus t prime is positive whenever t minus t prime is negative uh, this is zero so in a sense this is only defined in half of the real axis for for t minus t prime and the other the other uh 
the other half is going to be defined by by the the advanced ones and but we'll, we'll see how, how that translates into Omega okay now this is fine it, as long as this thing is limited in, in a sense uh, yeah it, if it is not limited save the cosine or, or, or something like that you you still get uh, you still get a well-defined Fourier transform but uh, one thing that is really really usual in physical systems is that the correlation functions have some time some sort of decay so the correlation functions between the operators they do not extend to to infinity and at some point they start decaying so some relaxation mechanism is usually uh, present that means that uh, in the limit for very long times these correlations fall off to zero uh, how do they fall off and and you know how fast and, and and so on that's that depends on on the specific relaxation mechanism but uh, here it is important that you, you have some like you know uh, some something that goes to zero for for very long times otherwise you would have say delta functions like if this is a sign at a given frequency right this of course will be zero to t minus t prime going to minus infinity but for t to to minus infinity if this is just a sign of omega t you, you get a kind of delta function here and 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 not really because see you, you only have half of it so you you won't need to recover the full delta function if you would add the retarded and the and the advanced ones so yeah we would like to have uh, a well-defined correlation functions for all frequencies so for that we need uh, this kind of an envelope that the correlation functions goes to zero at a very long times oops this is the advanced so let's get back to the retarded okay so in order to have to in introduce this what what does this relaxation mechanism would would do to the you know to the to the correlation function or the Fourier transform what would that mean uh, that would be equivalent of adding uh, a small imaginary part to the frequency here and 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 let's see how that would play out I mean if I would take this if I have this right this extra small part here that will reflect in the small in some relaxation mechanism that, that will take this correlation function to zero at longer times so let's see how how that would work let's go to the black so let's take t prime equals zero and uh, I want to calculate C A B of T when uh, C of A B Omega and that's all retarded okay is not Omega but Omega plus this small imaginary part so how do I calculate C A B of T well this would um, be the inverse of the Fourier transform right so it would be something like this an integral in Omega instead of e to the I Omega T I would get e to the minus Omega T T prime equals 0 of C a B Omega right okay so now this guy this guy has this small omega uh, omega uh, plus so by our definition there e minus e omega t this is integral of minus infinity 
in t prime of e plus e omega there is this plus here t prime right this is omega plus uh, uh, this is omega plus i n so yeah let's just write it like this and probably you're running I'm running out of space here so plus eta t prime right the same t prime c a b of t prime hopefully uh, yeah okay yeah let's hopefully didn't cut here hopefully not so yeah let's do it again minus omega d omega e minus omega t and here I'll have minus infinity dt prime uh, e i omega t prime times e minus and here plus i with plus i is a minus and t prime c a b t prime all right now this uh oh yeah i forgot one thing i forgot a two pi here for no normalization so that's the inverse so i, I need a two pi here and so i can i can do this minus infinity d t prime there's this exponential here that's going to be important it's going to kill everything for 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 longer times and now I, I, i'll write the integral in omega to e i omega t prime minus t c a b of t prime and this is just a representation for the delta function this is delta t minus t t prime minus t so this then would be it's kind of e minus eta t times the oh not t prime t c a b t and which goes to zero at longer times right so again would be something like it's kind of circular argument in in a sense uh you, you might call this the eta equals zero case and this is the the one with a with an eta right and of course so this is c and b retarded with an eta because now i'm, I'm taking the and the fourier transform with this plus i eta here and of course uh as if eta goes to zero and eta has to has to be always positive then c a b eta goes to c a b but when when we we add this small parameter here uh i can i satisfy the the, the regime that c a b eta going to infinity goes to go to infinity goes to zero so at longer times these guys decay and this is kind of my relaxation mechanism now you will see that uh, the limit 
ether going to zero has a an interesting meaning here right it means that I'm taking this frequency which is which now so Omega plus is not a complex number right so it has this well the real time so you might want to, to write like imaginary of Omega real part of Omega plus now you are kind of offsetting it from the real axis by a little bit right so this is the Omega plus has a small imaginary part and taking the limit eta equals zero you are doing with some sometimes well which is called the, the analytic continuation into the real axis you're going to the real Omega but in order to have the Fourier transform well defined we need this small imaginary part here for the retarded functions will be above the the real axis and as you saw, shall see in a moment for the for, this is for the retarded and for the advanced will be the below the the real axis so yeah I'm going ahead of myself here but notice that this will have implications for us meaning that sometimes we'll have to do many times many times sorry we'll have to do integrals in the complex plane uh, where omega is a, a complex number okay so let's go back to the slide so we can now define the Fourier transform in this way allowing omega to have a small imaginary part right so we ensure that that uh, the part that is time dependent goes to zero for very long times and we can recover the time dependent correlation function for the retarded case by taking the inverse for the transform and take the this eta going to zero that's the analytic continuation to the real axis so everything is is okay now uh, for the advanced case the things are much similar except that now uh, this this uh, function here is defined only for negative values of t minus t prime so for positive I don't need to care but I want that this needs to be taken care of right so for this Fourier transform to be well defined uh, and I need to take t minus t prime to minus infinity and then this goes to zero so now I'll need to to have that exponent e eta t minus t prime to be positive so i times minus i should be positive so I take to take omega to have a, a small negative imaginary part so the analytic continuation to recover CB at time t now has to go uh, with the limit of and going to zero but from negative values right or well they're positive values but still you're going from below approaching the real axis from below and not from above so with these uh, two uh, the advanced and retarded case then you can recover the full the full uh, Fourier transform right so now you, you have some some correlation function defined all over the axis of t minus t prime and 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 again uh, these have uh, very in important physical interpretations in terms of uh, how you calculate these correlation functions and we're going to see a special case of one of them which is the Green's function and how uh, then we, we can go from the Fourier space to the real time space and, and back and forth and, and, and back. Alright that's it for this class see you next class